Podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. This, this is Chris. Welcome to the webinar. Today is Tuesday, November the 6th. Happy Election Day. It'll be uh, interesting uh, <clears throat> 24 hours from now. What, how if the world looks any different than today. Let's go ahead and get started real quickly. I know everybody's uh, pretty busy. Um, just wanted to remind you that uh, we strive to be your power of the pattern solution. We want to show you a uh, different pattern that the patterns that the world creates, that billions of free thinking people create, uh, not based upon any uh, news headlines or anything like that. But uh, we want to really be efficient in sharing different pattern analysis with you and, and look at the, the patterns that uh, look to be presenting opportunities and where uh, stop losses would be. And so we appreciate uh, your, your membership. As a continued reminder, we just want to remind you that we're not bullish or bearish, not biased either way. The only thing that we're bullish on is continuing opportunities. And it's amazing uh, how much uh, different things look than 30 days ago at the last, uh, you know, Connect webinar series. So I want to go back beyond 30 days. I actually want to go back a, a few years and just kind of remind people of, uh, you know, maybe kind of where we are and, and, and why the markets are behaving somewhat the, the reason that they are. But this is a chart of the Dow Jones Industrials based upon monthly closing prices. And it highlights what we, we put this chart every week into the uh, global dashboards. But what we've done here is what we'll share every week is two of the most emotional um, turning points in the last 11 years took place, in my opinion, at the 2007 high, which was the peak before the financial crisis, and the 2009 low, which was the depth of the, the financial crisis. And so to me, it's always uh, important to see if markets can be impacted by really important turning points. And I continue to believe that this year is impacted by these two dates. But I want to just go back and remind you of how these two dates impacted, you know, the Dow and the S&P and the broad markets for a good period of time uh, back in 2015-16. But it was interesting that, uh, you know, when the market uh, hit the 161 level, which was around 18,000 in the Dow, you'll notice that it chopped sideways for months and months. And uh, as you step back and look, is, is that a W bottom on a, a weekly chart, which is, which is very possible. But the bottom line is, is this was a, a, a trading range. It was a time that frustrated both bulls and bears. You know, the bull could say we're in a bull market and we're not going anywhere. And the bear market can say the world's falling apart. And guess what? They were wrong too. It was just a narrow sideways trading range. But once it ended this range, you'll notice that it broke above it and then came back down. And this is about as ideal as it gets, everyone. You know, when you have a breakout, sometimes breakouts in regardless of the asset, stocks, bonds, commodities, uh, indices, uh, global uh, and in the states, that when a breakout happens, sometimes they never look back. But from many technical um, Biblical technical books, you know, one of the, the ideal situations is to use old resistance and test it as new support. So you see the Dow tried to break above, came back down and tested as old support, and then it took off. And after it finally broke out of this, you know, nearly 20 month trading range, around what, two years ago, folks, in the November 16 ele election, a rally of 50% took place in the following year. And so you know, these uh, key highs and lows of the past, you know, I don't think any of us will ever live long enough to know exactly why the math works out this way. I, I haven't lived long enough to figure it out other than to be aware of it. And my job is to try to empower you, all of you, of what to be aware of in certain circumstances. And so, you know, this became an opportunity for the patient. You know, once people were patient long enough, and then once it broke out, took place, we went to the long side, and it, and it was profitable. So earlier this year, I sent out an email on uh, the last day, next to the last day of February, February 27th, which was on a Tuesday, 
and I, I sent out the email that I hadn't sent in years and years and years. And it was essentially saying, there's, this is a, there's a really good chance through all of my, at this time it was 38 years of uh, charting experience in, in the financial services business, I felt like capital preservation time was here. Not that the world was gonna end, bear markets were just gonna you know, uh, take over the world or anything like that. It's just that folks, we were back at another key Fibonacci uh, extension level, similar to in 2014. And so I just suggested at that time that they don't be surprised for the markets just to go nowhere and to be choppy. And you know, lo and behold, for the majority of assets from stocks and bonds and commodities, a simple treasury bill since February the 27th has outperformed most assets. And this is why I su suggested this at this number one. This is the same chart as we started off the webinar with. We applied uh, Fibonacci to the uh, 2007 highs and 2009 lows on the left side of the chart. And this is the 261 level. And I was just really, folks, you know, leaning towards the past, saying once the market hit the 161 level, it chopped sideways for a long period of time and built an upper level base. So, so far, you know, what has happened since the 261 level has happened? Well, one, it's, it's choppy. Two, it's just, what, still in a narrow range, folks. So, to me, this is, is, shouldn't be a surprise to any of you. You know, does it, just because I share something uh, could happen, does it mean that it has to happen? And the answer is no. But humbly, this doesn't surprise me that this type of price action has taken place. And so this is a, a busy chart, but this is, you know, when you, you think of asset allocation, and not that any of you listening to this call are, but there are millions of people in America and financial representatives that still do asset allocation, and it's not broke. But if you think about, you know, when that email went out, capital preservation, you know, just be careful, you know, you're going to struggle to make much money. If you'd said, well, I think I'll just put some money in some big caps and some small caps, uh, the New York Stock Exchange, I'll put some money in bonds, I'll put some money in gold, I'll put some money in Europe, I'll put some money in emerging markets, and I'll put some money in China. When you look on the right side of the chart, since the end of February, these performances on the right side of the chart, they're all in the negative. So if you would think from an asset allocation perspective and trying to just buy some stuff and diversify your way out of it, this has been a fugly year. And I'd have to say, I don't have any proof of it, folks, but in my 38 years, it's really hard for me to remember a, you know, we're 11 months into a year that at a calendar year into the 1st of November, that all of these assets are to the negative. And obviously the S&P down 2%, that's, that's not much whatsoever. But we know if we turn to the world's uh, uh, stock markets, it, it has been a, a pretty frustrating year. But anyway, it still amazes me how once that 261 level was hit and the market turned on that dime and the trading range started, there's just been a lot of sideways action. And you know, my, my suggestion back then was to, to be patient, keep cash levels high. When you make a trade, uh, look for uh, low exposure and tight stops because of this choppy action you know, that I felt was should take place. And, and for the most part, it has. So an, enough about those key levels. I want to continue with the theme that we have for months on the good, the bad, and the, and the ugly. I, I like this because there always is this type of criteria going on. And so let's look at the good from a really short-term perspective. You know, the markets are a lot different than where we were 30 days ago, but this is an example that they're a lot different than over almost two decades ago. This is the, uh, the inflows into the RightX Bear Fund. RightX is a, uh, a mutual fund family that has uh, long and short funds for people to choose from, no fees, uh, no exchange back and forth wrinkles on limitations or anything like that. And for any of you that have been long-term members or looking at the blogs, we've, we've quoted statistics from RightX for a long time. Uh, before I started writing the newsletter, when I still in my financial planning practice, we had the bulk of our assets. Uh, we moved them over to the RightX uh, fund family. Um, it, 
in the very, very late 90s, early 2000s, because of Sir John had shared with me that he thought the buy and hold approach would just perform flat to down for 15 years to come. So I wanted, so I moved a lot of our uh, money. So I know this fun family well. But this is an amazing statistic that, you know, we went down in uh, this past month in October, less than we did in February. But check out how much money flowed into the bear funds or into the, the right X bear fund. So it's amazing that the largest inflow to this bear fund took place in nearly 20 years on a, like a seven or eight percent correction. I mean, that's amazing. And it, to me, it's a, a short term good news historically. And so along the same line, this is an ETF called Bill, which is uh, all about owning treasury bills. And you can see to the right, this is daily inflows over the last six years that just a week and a half ago, because I shared this with all of you, all of the membership uh, last week, that the largest single day inflow into cash took place in six years. Now, this is an extreme. And so we're trying to look for extreme opportunities through people being scared. And obviously, this was taking place right into Halloween. This is from Sentiment Trader, and this is, they have a, a collection of, uh, don't get me on, on the exact number, but between 30 and 40 different indicators. And so they try to rank the indicators, how many uh, represent excess optimism and how many reflect excess pessimism. And so you can see, just think about it back and forth, when very few uh, indicators are expressing optimism and a lot of them are expressing pessimism this indicator is low and you can see by the green vertical shaded bars when this spread is typically low the market is closer to a low than a high and then the polar opposite when it's up it's not quite in my opinion it's not quite as good of an indicator but it still is pretty decent about saying that markets are somewhat fully valued at that point in time so as you can see in the, in the lower right, that uh, this uh, optimism, pessimism spread is at a level only seen like four to five other times in the last seven years. Typically the market was closer to a low, but it's, it's interesting that at our last webinar, look where it was folks. So just using this tool, it shouldn't be a surprise that we saw some of the action that we did. The CNN um, uh, fear, uh, greed index that we share uh, every week in the sectors report is at a current reading of nine. You can see a year ago it was at 66. A month ago it was at 33, and it was starting to express you know some fear. But this is definitely at one of the lower levels uh, in, in several years. This is a reminder of the smart money, dumb money spread uh, that we've been we share uh, every week as well. But you'll notice. Um, Let's just go back uh, roughly about a month or, or so, excuse me, uh, at the market highs, you'll notice that the dumb money was getting fairly confident and smart, smart money was getting very concerned. And so if you go back to the first of the year at the market peak, you can see how confident that dumb money was and how smart money was, was very concerned uh, about where the market was at that stage. And you can see that the very sharp, almost 10% correction took place place in the S&P 500 and look how the smart money flipped and then so did the dumb money as well. So this is the widest spread between the smart and dumb money taking place right now that we've seen since the first of the year. And historically, when the spread is this wide, the market is often closer to lows than highs. I know you probably looked at this chart and said, whoa, and I, I don't blame you. I, I did. The bottom line is, let's just cut to the chase here. This is from Ned Davis Research, and it's all about the, just look at this bottom line down here where my arrow is. It's the percent of stocks above their 10-day moving average. And obviously, this is a really short uh, indicator. But these arrows that you see they plotted there, let's read this little piece. It's arrows that are shown initial dates when the indicator rose above 90% after falling to at least 10% in between. So if you look down here at the, at the very lower right, there was less than 10% of the S&P 500 stocks that were above their 10-day moving average. 
and you can see currently the reading is 79. So if this market would move up just a little bit more, you would see that the first buy arrow, in other words, that after so many stocks being below their 10 day moving average have moved back. If 90% move above that 10 day moving average, oftentimes that was fairly close to some to bottoms or in other words, where the market turned up. You can see that over the years. And a up arrow has not taken place since the prior election. So this is kind of a, an interesting outlier that I'll try to, to keep track for you. But this just kind of shows uh, an extreme because when you look since 2009, this is the longest period without an arrow. So as we uh, embark on the, the election today, I thought it was kind of interesting to look back as where were we two years ago today? In other words, two years ago on the Tuesday of the election in 2016. And so this is a daily chart uh, on the Dow with relative momentum above. So you can see that going into the election, you can see it down here at the bottom, the market was drifting lower around the 18,000 level, but you can see that uh, relative momentum was into, over, into the oversold readings. And when you look now in the, in the past two years, we are now at the, the lowest oversold daily readings. We just hit that uh, last week since the prior election. Excuse me. And while uh, momentum is oversold, you can see, folks, that really the, the market is, is what? It's, again, it's nothing besides a narrow trading range. And the decline uh, over the last month went from the top of it to the bottom of it. Just really simple. And now we're about 40%. Uh, up off the lows when you think of the range or, or near the halfway point. So I find it really intriguing as we're going into this election to see pessimism very high, money flowing into bear funds, money flowing into T-bills, pessimism very high, and you know all, so many of the stocks you know below their 10-day you know moving average, and then to see something like this. So the stage is set from a short-term perspective. That's why I sent out that email last week to all of you to, to don't be surprised to see a short term bounce in the market as I shared some of these charts and, and, and many more. And another key one, uh, you know, that we really want to watch well that's at extremes as far as um, weekly uh, prices. This is the transportation index. You'll notice this bottom line is drawn off the 2009 lows. There's the 2016 lows that the transportations have done nothing more than the broad markets and like many indices, it's just in a narrow trading range, this blue shaded trading range. And it went from the top of the range to the bottom of the range in the in a little bit over six weeks time period. And it took falling momentum, creating lower highs to the most oversold level since 2016. So from a an oversold support perspective, transports are at a very sweet opportunity that uh, one should expect, you know, a rally. And then stepping back, obviously, despite oversold readings, if this triple support would give way, we would now have for the first time in 15 months, an intermediate cautionary flag being raised that transports would be signaling caution that has not, a uh, message like that has not been sent since uh, clear back in uh, 2016. Good friend Ryan Dietrich always has great stats and you know this is another one but I want to kind of remind everyone as the, the day before the, the election that these are the performance returns from the October closing low to the year end in midterm years. And the bottom line on the right is this is a, a pretty amazing number to me going clear back 60 years that essentially in the last couple of months of the year in a midterm election year, the S&P has averaged a gain of 10.7%. And so when you think from short-term performance, what would be ideal in any time window for the market to rally strongly in, in a lot of ways, it would be that it had done poorly right before that window and fear was very high. So it doesn't mean that 
a rally has to happen. But if you had set back, say on the 4th of July, and you said, what is the most ideal scenario towards the end of this year, knowing that it's a midterm election year and the rally is strong, you'd say, well, really, ideally, it'd be as the market looked ugly going into that time frame. And we just got it last month. Here's another look at how the typical performance pans out uh, during a midterm election year since 1950. And the bottom line is I added this green shaded box from around the 1st of November. You can see what typically happens in a midterm election year uh, for the S&P 500 two year end. And you can see, let's just make a round number. Let's say that this was 2%. And the average gain up is around seven from that point. So there's a, uh, on average, about a 500 basis point rally that takes place from November the 1st through the end of the year. So it's uh, obviously a pretty strong time period. Another look at returns in midterm election periods, one month before and two months after, that's a really similar one to Ryan's. You know, this goes back clear into the, the 19. 40s. So this is a really long-term uh, perspective. And you can see right here in the middle in the light blue that the median gain over this time period is 8%. And there was one losing window, which was 1978, uh, which was a decline of about 4%. And you can see there was some pretty strong, uh, you know, just think about this. These are two-month decline clear out here on the right side. So again, as a reminder, uh, I don't believe that we should invest purely on seasonalities, but I believe that we should be aware of some of these patterns. You know, these, you know, we can look at uh, seasonal patterns in bonds and cocoa and, you know, coffee and gold and you know, all of this stuff. You know, those are yearly seasonals, but keep in mind that these are just seasonals that take place once every four years, you know, from a midterm election perspective. So these are some pretty impressive uh, numbers during those time frames. So I think when you, you boil a, a lot of this down is the, the, this dual chart uh, represents uh, the equal weighted S&P 500, trying to not to let FANG stocks, uh, more influence prices or whatever. This is RSP. You can see in the blue shaded area, folks, it's not a bull or a bear market. It's just a uh, sideways chop. And here we were in, in September, there was a, a break above the January highs by a, a little bit, and you see a reversal, and then selling pressure just took place. And then there was uh, just a cup last week when we see it testing the bottom of the, the trading range and bullish reversals took place. So the bottom line is, is if this seasonality, I, I want you to kind of have these two charts in mind, if you see RSP break falling resistance and the VIX break rising support at the same time, it would be a, a nice little kickoff to suggest that the midterm election upward cycle pressure is, is taking place. You know, so um, as you know, uh, right in the, in the face of all of this, we picked up uh, some ownership of RSP last week due to fear being high and RSP being at the bottom of the trading range. And then we set, set a stop below that. So it'd be interesting if we'd see RSP uh, fade down a little, you can see on a very short term perspective, this has a chance to be an inverse head and shoulders, which would be especially bullish. Uh, again, the takeaway on this chart, if fear breaks support at two and RSP breaks resistance at two, it would be a, a positive short term signal for the broad market. So, so those were all good things for uh, a short-term rally to take place. Let's we'll start now thinking a little bit more intermediate and look at some bad uh, things or bad vibrations that are taking place. One of the things that we want to look at in this area are canaries in a coal mine. In other words, what type of things in the past were decent indicators to tell us where stocks might go in the future? I want to start off with uh, just the tone of leadership. This is the uh, NASDAQ 100 S&P 500 ratio over the last eight years. And you can see in the, the green shaded bar that when this ratio is heading up, tech is doing better than the S&P 500. So you can see it's done much better than uh, the S&P for several years. 
But going into uh, just this past summer, you can see at one, it hit the top of this channel and then it started to drift to where you saw some equal performance and then actually weaker performance of tech compared to the broad markets. And then that's been uh, amplified the last few weeks. And you can see that this leader for seven years is actually for the first time in a couple of years expressing some weakness and breaking potentially dual support. It would be breaking the lows over the last 12 months and rising support over the last couple of years here at two. So this is from a, a, a stepping back a little bit further. This is definitely a cautionary note from leadership. And speaking of leadership, we continue to put uh, SMH or semiconductors in the um, sectors report because you know when you think of from the 2009 lows, two year better places to have uh, outperformed the S&P since the 2009 lows was QQQ or the NASDAQ 100 and SMH, which was semiconductors. They both, uh, they almost doubled the performance of the S&P off the 09 lows. But you'll notice for uh, over a year that there's been mostly this sideways chop. Uh, SMH has remained inside this green uh, channel one for the last few years, but weakness of late has it breaking below the rising channel and the 2018 lows. And it's come back this past week and it's kissing the underside of both of these. And so to me, the billion dollar question for leadership is, can it break back above dual resistance at two? And if it does, it would show that this was nothing more than an overthrow and a fake out to the downside. Where the bullish picture from an intermediate to long term perspective would get a, a negative message from this leader is if this resistance turns into an 800 pound gorilla and starts heading south. So this is a, a really key uh, price point for the NDX SPY ratio, as well as semiconductors. This looks at uh, the NASDAQ 100 only. It does something similar as far as Fibonacci extensions. We publish this uh, every week. This takes the 2000 high in tech, which in my opinion was you know, the, the most important price point in uh, the past 20, 25 years. So it takes the high in 2000 and the low in 2003, and it looks at this 90% decline in tech. So since then, obviously uh, tech has outperformed the broad market since 2003, has also outperformed it since 2009, but it's the rally off the 2003 lows has come up to the 161 extension level. And everyone, this is a, a monthly chart. I try to reduce noise by using the monthly chart. But if you'll notice buried right in there, that's two months ago. This would have been, this is this month, a few days in. This red bar was October, and this was September. And you'll notice right in there that that pattern right at the 161 level has could be taking the shape of two things, either a doji star topping pattern or a hanging man pattern based upon a monthly basis. So obviously softness has come in. To me, the, the big message on an inter, intermediate term time frame would be as if the Qs break support at 160, the 160 zone, which would be support off the 09 lows and the bottom of the trading range over the last year and a half, that definitely would raise a bearish flag if that support gives way. So uh, the NASDAQ continues uh, its, itself in a sideways trading range, <coughs> excuse me, with the 160 level being the low and 183 being the high at the Fibonacci 161 extension level. So another piece from a, an intermediate term perspective, this looks at uh, the S&P 500 on a weekly basis. And you'll notice since uh, 1980, the 87 crash, that the majority, uh, starting in 1990, the majority of the time over the last uh, what, 28 years, excuse me, 18 years, the S&P has spent the majority of its time in this rising channel. So here's some factors we want to look back on 2000 and 2007. And when I refer to 2000 and 2007, I, I continue to refer to those dates because they were dates where tops took place. 
I don't refer to the dates because of 50% declines in the S&P. We always want to look back on those as what did those tops walk like and quack like and smell like and sound like? You know, let's look at for those type of comparisons. So you'll notice in 2000, you see a rising support line. You see the 200 day moving average in red. You see the top of the channel. You see a weekly divergence. You see a negative divergence was taking place before the top. But once the divergence was taking place, multi-year support was broke and it turned and broke below the 200 day moving average at one here in 2000, a lot of selling pressure took place. 2007 had a very similar look, multi-year rising support line. Divergence was uh, a negative divergence and momentum was taking place. So in other words, while the market was going up, momentum was uh, heading, uh, creating lower highs. Once it broke below multi-year support and the 200 day moving average, then a lot of selling pressure came in. So in 2018, we have some similar parallels to 2000, 2007. We have a long-term support line in play. We have a rising 200 day moving average in play and we have momentum creating lower highs. So what would send a, a, uh, a very, an intermediate cautionary message and it potentially could you know, turn into a very negative one is if the S&P breaks the February lows, breaks below the 200 day moving average and breaks this nine year support line at two, that would definitely send a, a longer term negative message you know, to the broad markets. So a really key support test is in play for the broad markets as it's creating lookalike patterns to 2000 and 2007. You know, when we speak of canaries in a coal mine, we've, continue, we've uh, been updating members for months and months and months that, you know, this go nowhere to down action has taken place really should not be a surprise because of the various divergences that we've shared with you for months and months. But just as a recap, when you look back into 2005, six and seven, home builders started diverging for a couple of years before the S&P turned lower. But once it broke the bottom of its descending triangle, and remember a bearish descending triangle suggests that prices will fall and its accuracy rate is correct two thirds of the time. Once it broke the bottom of that of uh, its trading range or the bottom of that descending triangle, selling pressure really ramped up in home builders. And that's where the S&P started rolling over, you know, itself. So I find it really intriguing that um, home builders are down uh, while the S&P is close to flat on the year, I believe home builders have lost about a third of their value. Obviously a big uh, punch in the gut already has taken place, but you'll notice that it's actually testing potential support, which if you go back to 2007 was the same support level that once it broke, that's when all heck broke loose. So this is a key support level uh, for the home builders that if they would happen to break down here at two, they'd send a, a real negative message to the broad market. And it would really become negative if home builders would break the 2007 support here, as well as the S and P breaking the February lows at three. So those kind of some boy scouts uh, ahead of time, be prepared. This is what I want you to know what to watch for, for, uh, the markets breaking from the trading ranges into bear markets. Another one that amazes me in, in some ways, which was a, another canary in a coal mine was the banking index. The banking index started turning down ahead of the markets in 2007. They were a good canary in a coal mine. But if we step back, this is a 26 year chart of uh, the banking index, but you can see in the blue shaded area, it's really in a gigantic, multi-decade trading range that both of the bottoms occurred at the same level and there's a chance that tops occurred in 2007 and 2018. So you can see in 2007 when the multi-year uh, support um, broke here and monthly momentum was lofty and turning lower, that's when banks really struggled. You can see that we're seeing a series of lower highs in the upper right at one. We also, again, this is a monthly chart, we see lower highs and a break of the lows for the year taking place at two. So uh, again, another divergence is sending a very uh, cautionary message to the broad market in the big picture. 
So let's look at, you know, the ugly side of things and as far as what would you look for to, uh, to get the need or the suggestion to actually short stocks, which from a big picture perspective, we have not received to this time frame. We're in a trading range. I've uh, bought a, an S&P, or excuse me, a, a NASDAQ short. We bought a, a Russell short first. We made some money on it, lost a little bit on a short-term trade in the, in the uh, inverse uh, NASDAQ. But this would be a, another big one that we'd wanna watch for that would send a really negative message to and, and a, kind of a, a heads up to where you might wanna look at shorting the market if we see more follow through, but this is the NYSC looking back over the 20 years. And this is a chart that we first started sharing with you in February of this year, highlighting monthly hanging man patterns. And so if you'll see in, in the 2000 high, a hanging man pattern took place in 2000 at one. You see it take place again in 2000 here at one. You see it take place again at 2011 at one. And the average decline was 30% between those three different, um, we would want to call it, we could call it a bear, a bear market because the declines were greater than, than 20%. I'm not into labels, but these were some very significant declines. So uh, in February, another hanging man pattern took place just under the January highs here at two. You see the NYSE index is nothing, it's more than a trading range. But if that trading range would break at three, it would definitely send a bearish message from one of the, the broader indices in the states, especially uh, following a hanging man pattern a few months ago. Another one that we would wanna really uh, pay attention to is that to me, a, a really negative um, message is, has not been sent from the AD line, the advanced decline line so far. We have seen the AD line obviously uh, roll over and it reflects more declining issues than advancing. But to me, the, a, a bearish message or really concerning message would take place if the AD line would happen to break below the February lows. And you can see that that has not taken place so far. But it, again, that's something to put down in your checklist. Well, if the NYSE breaks its trading range, S&P breaks its trading range, transports break triple support. If the AD line breaks the February lows, these would all signal that there's a disruption to the multi-year uptrend. This busy chart looks at here in the middle, this is the five-year yield uh, interest rates, the, the yield on the five-year note over the last 20 years with an overlay of the S&P 500 on the bottom. This is on a monthly basis with momentum up above. But you'll notice when interest rates were rising and then they rolled over and broke support in 2000 and once rates started heading south, so did stocks. Turn the page to 2007, once they broke multi-year support, you see momentum turning down that yields fell, bonds rallied and stocks fell also. It's, it's hard to believe I mean, there's a, that's a 50% decline obviously in stocks right there. So yields now are back up at resistance based upon the 2000 and 2007 highs. Monthly momentum folks is the highest in history. So there's no date to even go back and there's just look how sky high that is. And you can see that the S&P is in this obviously a four year rising channel. So the ugly message would take place in my opinion if yields and stocks would both break down at the same time. And so one of the things that I imagine that all of you have noticed that despite the six or 7% decline in stocks this past month, interest rates didn't back off. So I think that's actually a positive for stocks, but I do wanna say, and then I'll repeat it through a few different upcoming charts. You know, right now, if interest rates would fall, I think it'd be a, a very negative message uh, for stocks. So this looks at over the last, what, 40 years, the S&P 500 to the 10 year yield ratio. And you can see since uh, the early 80s for uh, almost 40 years, this ratio has been in a well-defined uptrend characterized by rising channel one. 
Now, over the last couple of years, there's a chance that a head and shoulders topping pattern has taken place as it's testing the neckline and what would we say, folks, 35 year support here at two. So again, if this ratio would break down, it would send one of its first long term um, trend change messages that we've seen in, in uh, at least a decade. So uh, again, another key inflection point is taking place. This was another canary in a coal mine that we've been sharing for a long time. This is a junk bond fund, the uh, PHDAX from PIMCO on the top, the S&P 500. Uh, if you've been a member for a while, you know that there was a two-year bearish divergence in 2000, followed by a 50% decline in the S&P. There was a seven-month divergence in 2007, followed by a 50% decline in the S&P. And we've now seen the second longest bearish divergence in junk bonds in the last uh, 20, 25 years. And so junk bonds are testing support off 2009 and the S&P is right there as well. So the long-term trend would get an ugly message if both of these would break down at the same time. So here's another way to look at yields and the stock market. I know this is kind of a busy chart, but the bottom line is, is I think that uh, the long-term stock bull trend has its fingers crossed that interest rates do not peak at current levels. So this chart, the first one on the left is two-year yields. The one in the, excuse me, the one on the left is five-year yields. The one in the middle is two-year. And I've got those mislabeled. I apologize for that. I just caught myself. And then this is the Dow on the right. The bottom line is whether they're the two or the five, both the two and the five are testing 18 and 38 year falling resistance levels with no monthly momentum at levels not seen in the past 50 years. As the Dow is kissing the underside of a rising channel line that's based upon 1929 and 2000 right up here. And if anybody knows the Fibonacci sequence, I find it a, a little fingernail on a chalkboard that we are now 89 years after the 1929 high, which happens to be one of the numbers in the Fibonacci long-term sequence. So again, um, you'd want to look at you, or you could really get, all of us could get a very negative message or a, a constructive message that the long-term trend change in stocks could really be uh, experienced going to have some rough waters ahead of it if yields would happen to back off at these long-term resistance lines at each one. Another big picture, I, I still believe, I've, I've shared it a few times, that uh, crude oil is one of the most important commodities on the planet because it, it can be traded as a currency. It obviously impacts our, our lives as far as uh, what we pay for petroleum-based products from gasoline at the pump and, and you name it. But we applied Fibonacci to the monthly closing prices in 2008 here at one, and then again at the monthly closing prices after the collapse into 2016. And you'll notice that the 38% retracement level of that, that giant move from 140 a barrel down to, uh, you know, from a monthly closing basis, around 34 bucks. But you can see that this is the 38% Fib level and it's possible that it's created a double top. And then you'll notice it tried to break out. This is again, this is a monthly bar last month it attempted and then it just quickly reversed and then went from a, a bearish or a fake out trying to suck the blast a minute long traders in to where now it's closed below its trading range and breaking support off the 2016 lows. So if this would continue to head south, part of its underlying message could be a softening in global economy. And historically, you would uh, more often than not, yields back off and bonds rally when crude oil prices fall. Bond uh, holders would really prefer falling crude prices over rising crude prices. So. 
this could really be an important signal for from kind of a more macro perspective, you know, everyone. So just uh, kind of thinking about some extremes, these, these emotions taking place. You know, we started off the webinar that there was a, a lot of panic going on. And I want to remind everybody of, you know, as we're starting a new month, this is the list of S&P 500 stocks. You know, let, let's, let's say from a short-term perspective that, you know, all the money piling in the T-bills, the VIX being high, all the money piling into the right X bear fund, and the seasonality would suggest that we've got a little upside bump taking place, that the bottom of the trading range holds. These stocks could become really some nice upside surprises long as the bottom of that trading range holds. So I want to reiterate that there could be some real opportunities here in these stocks that typically do well in the month of November for the last 10 years. And so I wanted to show you just a, a few of them that I've, I have buy alerts on if further upside action takes place. So this is Dollar Tree. It's typically done uh, well in the last decade in November with a median gain of uh, just short of 10% in the month of November. You can see that it's uh, this year has continued to create a series of lower highs and flat bottoms. There's a chance that this is a bearish descending triangle pattern. There's no doubt about that. But over the last, um, this is a weekly chart, over the last couple of months, you see the sideways action taking place. So if we were to experience a rally and it would break out to the upside, I'm gonna look at being a buyer of this seasonally strong stock, which is DLTR, it's a symbol for Dollar Tree. Another one to keep a, a close eye on is, is Macy's. You can see that Macy's, this is a two and a half uh, year chart, um, has created a series of lower highs, but since um, the beginning or late 2017, you can see that it's created a series of, of higher lows and it's facing the top of its trading range and this overhead resistance line. So the median gain in the month of November for Macy's is around 7%. And so I have a buy order in that if it breaks out of the trading range and this falling resistance, I'm gonna to look to be a buyer. We're looking here at uh, Foot Locker. It's averaged gaining in the last 10 years of the month of November, a little over 7%. You can see in the blue shaded area on the right that it's been in a trading range. And again, the same thing would apply. I've got a, a buy uh, alert in my system set up that if it breaks above the top of this trading range, we'll look to be a buyer. And then lastly, as far as individual stocks, this is not on the list, but it's a, a chart that uh, intrigues me, which is Pepsi and uh, symbol PEP. This is not on the, again, this is not on the November seasonal list, but it is facing falling resistance and the highs of the past few months right here at the 115 level, essentially where we about closed out today. And uh, so if Pepsi would break out above dual resistance, I've got an alert there. So don't be surprised to possibly get an alert on Pepsi if the market behaves, you know, going forward. So we're gonna just kind of try to wrap things up. I just kind of want to talk about a couple of big picture perspectives and, and why it's, uh, critical that if support levels would break to the downside, it's, it's kind of like these canaries in a coal mine. We've been talking to you about home builders and we've been talking to you about banks. And in the last uh, 30 minutes, uh, Zillow, which is tied to the um, kind of the housing industry, obviously, you know, is that another canary in a coal mine? But anyway, obviously the market is not open tomorrow, but in the aftermarket, uh, as we speak, Zillow's down about 20%. So, you know, we're seeing softness in one of the most critical uh, sectors, you know, to our, our country, you know, which is real estate. But sticking with this chart, going back to it, this chart looks busy, but the blue line is the S&P 500. And then the red and green is the amount of money, what, uh, advisor perspectives and, and Doug Short calls negative and positive credits. You know, and the bottom line is, is when there's a, a negative credit balance, this is just when people have borrowed a lot of money. So this was at 2000. So you see the spread between the two. And obviously that's when the market dropped, uh, peaked, fell 
Then you can see where people unwound their, uh, their margin accounts to where they actually had a positive credit, which became fuel for the next rally. And you can see this fuel was for months hit the highest level in a couple of years as the market was bottoming in 2003. Turn the page forward to 2009, you had a, a negative credit taking place again. The market peaked in 2007 and then it fell apart. And then you could see that became an extremely bullish positive credit balance taking place near the 2009 lows. And so what that reflected folks is what we've seen in the last nine years that ended up being that there was a ton of fuel to push the market higher. So now you see in, in the lower right that we have the largest negative credit balance uh, in American history while the market is at very lofty prices. And so this is why I say when we look at the good, the bad, the ugly, the good, I don't, it doesn't matter that it's, it's bullish or bearish being good. It's just we've got some good extremes going on and we have support levels in play, which means that there could be a tradable opportunity to the upside but we move from the good to the bad to the ugly is, you know, as we've shared that if the trading ranges are broke to the, the downside, when we've had divergences and, you know, we've had canaries in the coal mine bankers and um, junk bonds and home builders acting negative, this could get really ugly if we see this uh, negative credit balance actually start shrinking. In other words, that would be people taking money out of their margins accounts. And so this is a, a, a excuse me, this is a, something to, to watch for. It's, it's not when the margin debt is all at, at lofty levels, it's the issue, folks. It's when it's at lofty levels and it starts to shrink. So one thing, these numbers only come out monthly, so it's nothing that you, we can watch but once every 30 days. But if this would start shrinking, going up, it would actually, that's a negative sign for the, the broad market. And another thing from the big picture where things could get ugly is, you know, this is a, to me, there's no um, holy grail, folks, of valuation indicators. But you know, I will say this is, you know, when Sir John set me down right in here and he said, you know, hey, Chris, I believe that that buy and hold, uh, just the the approach, um, pass, passive investing, which has become massive, you know, you know, what, what's the, the easiest thing to do is just go put it in an S&P 500 fund. Charles Schwab or somebody now is selling a, a funds or Vanguard with zero management fees. That's all that you got to do is just go buy the S&P 500 fund. But as Sir John, you know, said, you know, right here in, in the late 90s, there's several reasons that he felt like the, the passive investing style, the buy and hold would struggle for 10 to 15 years to come one of the reasons was valuations. And so I like this chart from D Short because it's not about one valuation metric, it's a composite of, of four different ones. And the bottom line is, is it's, uh, it's high, it's a little bit below 2000. You can see that it's above 2007 levels, but I think this is what I really want you to, to take away from this chart when these, where did quality, long lasting, five to 10 to plus years, where did they all start? And they started with those green arrows. They started when valuations were ridiculously low. And this is where I happened to be blessed and got into this business in 1980 uh, when the Dow was below 1000. So this is really hits me very interesting to me as far as looking at this from a you know, this is only folks 120 year chart. So the flip side of it is, then let me pose a question to you. How many quality bull markets that lasted three to five years took place at these red arrows? And the answer is none, not one. There wasn't one outlier of quality bull markets that took place when these indicators were at these red arrows. And so the bottom line is, is we're at very elevated valuation levels. That's why, to me, folks, the bottom of this trading range with these divergence that are taking place are really important. That's why the AD line, if it would happen to break below uh, the February lows, that would be another key long-term message. And that's why this is so important from you know this this nine pack 
This is a global nine pack. We've got the S&P in the upper left. We've got the Dow in the middle in the top row and the NASDAQ. In the middle row, we've got small caps, mid caps in the middle, value line geometric on the right. And then the lower level is international. This is Germany. In the middle is France. And the lower right is London. The bottom line is they're all still in bull trends. This sideways chop to let's exaggerate a little, a 10% decline. You know, the markets haven't fallen quite that much, but the decline that's taken place of late hasn't broken the long-term uptrends. But what I've, what I've tried to share for the majority of this year is I've tried to share levels where the bull trends don't want to see selling take place. And so far, that's what we're seeing is selling take place at these very awkward or vulnerable price points. And so, Again, this is why when valuations are this high, um, and some of these indicators are where they are, that a long-term trend change could take place based upon if the February lows are broken to the downside. And as we go into the election, you know, some of the parties to be uh, want to say consumer confidence is great, and so that's great for the market, and it is great to see consumer confidence high. And it is great to see the market at an all-time high. The only problem is, is when you put the two together, it's not really been that great for passive investing. So this looks at the conference, the consumer confidence that we've shared going back, what, 26 years. But the bottom line in 2000, when consumer confidence was really high and, and stocks were hitting an all-time high, there just wasn't much more good things that there was to take place. And so that's why this is another reason why I want to look at what did 2000 walk and talk and quack like and then what did 2007 walk and talk and quack like so you can see we were at a high and you see consumer confidence was fairly lofty and now we're at the highest levels in consumer confidence since 2000 as the market is up against long-term rising channels so again these are different pieces that i want to share some really big picture perspective and so as we're about finished this, this is along the same line the same theme. This is the Dow. Uh, I, I actually just shortened up the time frame, but these channels, this top line goes back to 1929, and this bottom line goes back to the early 40s. But the bottom line is, is the Dow is up at the top of a 70-year channel, and at the same time, this is the 10-year yield, it's facing a resistance line that was highly important in 2000 and 2007. So what I want you to Part of the, today's talk was to think of the Boy Scout motto and, and what are they known for is they were known for being prepared. What, you know, they play what ifs, what's the game plan if certain things happen. And so right now to me there has not been a cause to look at, to call this a bear market because it's not, it's just a sideways chop. It still has just as much chance of breaking above the highs and above the 261 as it does of breaking the trading range. But I want you to keep this in mind that if you see yields declining and bonds rallying and you see these yields break these steep rising supports and the Dow breaks below this trading range, it would be suggesting that the long term trend is getting damaged in a way we haven't seen in uh, like 11 years. So this is really key that I think, you know, if we do see stock weakness and all of a sudden bonds take off, this is something bigger than just a trading range taking place. So I want to uh, thank you all for your attendance. Thank you for your membership. Um, and thank you for being on, on the webinar, listening to, to some of these very fun things. So I think this is still some very exciting times. So I, I look forward. There's a chance with uh, some of the activity that's going on that we may be doing a, an, another webinar um, in between next month. So just stay tuned and watch for your emails. So all the best to all of you and, and thanks so much and take care. See you next month.